Good, good, good morning. Good evening. Good evening. Let's all stand and turn to page number whatever it is, 380, page 383. Yeah, and uh, I didn't just wake up, I promise. 383, no, not one, sing it out. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Lift it up. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls. This he says. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day. for that principle and what a blessing that is all right my voice started going out there a little bit so uh hopefully it'll hang in there uh glad to see you and thank you uh for being here let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer and then we'll be seated and read a couple of missions letters brother kyle open us in prayer please Amen. You may be seated. And I, let's see, Hayden, right on there. There should be another missions letter on the copier. Maybe I left before it spit it out or something because it's not here. But in the meantime, we will read our missions letter from the Skeen family, missionaries to Russia. Again, you say, I feel like we hear from certain people more than others. And my wife has made that comment. And some send letters more often than others. All right. So uh, some of our missionaries send them every single month, some of them. Uh, every other month we send support checks every three months and so the tradition is <laughs> I have a friend who actually is very hardcore about it 
He, does, he says, I'll send your, mis- your support check when you send me a letter. And so if we did that, we would only expect them every three months anyway. So but, uh, uh, I, I, so, but some of them sent them monthly, and so you might hear their name a little more often. All right, and uh, thank you, brother. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Must have spit out of the copier after I left, all right? But, so the Skeen family, missionaries to Russia, <clears throat> says this, uh, their May 2021 update. May started with the holidays so ubiquitous, that's a big word, across Eastern Europe celebrating labor, Easter victory over the Axis powers, and remembering those who gave their lives for their countries. I had the opportunity on May 9th, which is Mother's Day slash Victory Day there, to preach again in Russian. My Russian teacher says that my speech is better than my writing because she can see all of my mistakes when they are on paper. However, I did pull a decent grade from the class, and I am very thankful the Lord gave me the wonderful teacher that he did. The head missionary here received some exciting news that the church documents can undergo some imperative amendments for 10% of the price initially estimated, I guess for the building that they're buying. What was definitely... Uh, financially impossible before is now considered to be within reach. There is an answer to uh, many prayers. To obtain, to obtain Katrina's spousal visa, she and I will have to fly to Istanbul for a week during my final exams. It is the only viable option. Thankfully, all those exams can be completed online while we are taking care of this need. On the subject of exams, please pray that I'm able to pass all my other exams. Uh, two of the classes were taught completely in Ukrainian which is in breach of the university's contract with us foreign students, even though we have not yet learned the language completely, especially not at the lexical level required for study at a university. So please pray that we uh, pray, pray that it'll pass the test of those classes. Uh, please pray that we are allowed to go back and study in person at the university. Being around people produced an abundance of chances to talk about Jesus. I really miss the pre-COVID opportunities. With the weather warming, weekly evangelism could not be more eagerly anticipated. Each of the faithful church members even has an evangelism polo to wear now. Our family is hoping that we can encourage the others to be faithful witnessing, faithful in witnessing and distributing gospel tracts. The, word, uh, the words of a Soviet military command come to mind, and he wrote it in Russian right here. Obviously, I can't read that. Not a step backwards is what it means, though, all right? Not a step backwards. So keep praying for the Skeen family. <clears throat> and then our second missionary tonight is the Todd's. To Costa Rica, says, Dear Praying Friends, as I sit down to pen another prayer letter, I'm wondering what David would have written about those five smooth stones, what Moses would have written about coming down off Mount Sinai, encountering a golden calf, about what Jonah would have written about having experienced a whale from the inside, and how Paul would have explained the details of young John Mark coming back into the fold of laborers and being declared profitable for the ministry. Please consider the following thoughts as you pray for our family and ministry in Costa Rica, and thank you for doing so. Life here remains in a kilter as the Chinese virus challenges continue. They are indeed ministry hindering, but we can still see the Lord's directing hand at work. The recent high numbers of contaminations, hospitalizations, and ICU rates due to the virus have led government officials to place us once again under uh, unbelievable travel restrictions. It seems that for every step forward we, uh, get to, we take to get out of the situation, the government forces us to take two steps backward. It is as though common sense has become a lost commodity. At this writing, we can only drive every other day based upon the last number on one's license plates. All right, so be thankful you live in America in spite of all that we went through, okay? Perhaps the most troublesome aspect of the government-mandated Travel restriction revolves around the fact that the decisions are typically announced at the last minute and generally generally apply it for only one week. You can imagine how uncertain life has become, and we would ask you to pray accordingly. Yeah, but to have restrictions that only last a few days, and they're going to change again, it's hard to even settle. If you have bad restrictions, at least you can settle into something, and you know what to expect. But it's going to last a few days, and then lift, and then go down, and lift, and go down. That's got to be hard. Perhaps the most troubling <clears throat> non-church difficulty that is being faced here is with the students and their educations. Costa Rica was recently reported as being among the top countries of the world for having restricted in-person cl- school classes for the longest time. The school children here are taking a major hit. The Ministry of Education recently canceled classes completely and has changed the school year calendar, so the both students and teachers are now on an early Christmas break. <laughs> It almost seems as though we are witnessing, indeed, living through a dress rehearsal 
for the Antichrist tribulation activities. Without going into the details, we are also noting some rather troubling demonic activity here too. I hope we can count on your prayers in that regard also. For several weeks now, the church here in San Marcos and the one in Cañas and Juntas de Abangares have had to go back to online services. Pastor Marcos reports, however, that the attendance is getting better in the public Sunday services being held in Via Bonita, <clears throat> especially this Sunday evening service. What a major blessing. Edie, his wife, made a quick trip to the U.S. to celebrate Susan, our uh, third child's 40th birthday with both Amanda and Kelly. I can still remember that Susan was only nine months old when we moved to Costa Rica to begin our language learning process. As we have always noted, the Lord works out all the details for his will to be accomplished. As Edie was prepping to leave for the U.S. on an oil pressure problem developed in our trooper, considering all the current travel restrictions, I opted to go ahead and have the engine rebuilt. Little did I know that the internal parts for the six-cylinder engine uh, even though there's a lot of this particular vehicle in our country, were not available here in the local marketplace. Thank the Lord, I was able to order them all online and have Edie bring them in with her on the plane. <laughs> That's funny. I imagine uh, she's bringing home like auto parts, you know, in her suitcase. Here you go. Anyway, sorry, maybe I, I'm just a weird sense of humor. Uh, thank the Lord, I import taxes. Uh, I, I was able, I'm sorry, I already read that part. Thus avoiding the usually heavy import taxes. Ah, okay. Uh, avoiding the import taxes by sending them in her suitcases. At this writing, the, it, the, the vehicle should leave the shop in a few days. Pray that it would be a good rebuild. Sadly, our hopes and plans were dashed regarding being, beginning our meeting schedule in the uh, Capos area in April. The area remains a hotbed for the Chinese virus, and we have been asked to hold off for a while longer. Thankfully, the Lord continues opening doors to speak of him and the salvation he provides, whether it is with old men that live in our neighborhood who always seem to be, be present the most interesting questions about present, they seem to present the most interesting questions about God, or a young father who was contracted by our landlord to replace the electrical installation in our home. The opportunities keep coming. Please pray that the seed sown will produce fruit in the hearers. Fruit, however, in such a religious desert is difficult to come by, so do pray. And in closing, please pray as plans are in the works for the Via Benita seminary classes to be renewed in August. It looks like it will be an online adventure. Lots to pray about. But we know that we can count on you to pray. Thank you for your prayers, Ron and Edie Todd. All right, so good to hear from the Todd family. They're good folks. Amen. Let's all stand. 422. 422. Yesterday, today, forever. <clears throat> Sing it out. Oh, how sweet the glorious message sent full faith may claim. Yesterday, today, forever. Is the same. Still, he loves to save the sinful, heal the sick and lame. Cheer the mourner, calm the tent, glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never glory to his name. Glory to his name. Jesus never glory to on that last verse as of old <clears throat> them to abide so through all life's way he walketh ever near our side soon again shall we behold him hasten Lord the day but we'll still be this same Jesus amen Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for the good singing. Anybody else? Anybody else been battling allergies last week or so? Week or two? Man, I, don't, I have. I don't know. 
I, I was amazed. I came out here from, well, from everywhere else I've ever lived. I had allergy problems. And in the last six years, I haven't had hardly, almost six years now, I haven't had hardly any allergy problems. But the last week, I don't know, the pollen's different this year or what, man? It's, it's just uh, taking me to, to task. So anyway, so that might have something to do with my voice being kind of out. I don't know. But <coughs> anyway, let's take some prayer requests tonight. And uh, we will... Uh, Write down our missionaries, of course, that we read letters from, the, uh, the, the Skeen family and the Todd family. All right, pray for them. Um, um, pray for, um, if you got the prayer line call this morning, about Miss um, uh, Foster, Sarah Foster. All right, and uh, I did get to go in the hospital and see her. They're allowing people in. Actually, multiple multiple people in to see the same person. Amazing. So, um, so I got to go into ICU and see her. She was supposed to. I haven't heard yet whether they got her out of ICU, but today she's supposed to be sent to a regular room. It wasn't a, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, one of those devastating strokes that is, uh, you know, takes takes somebody's life. Obviously, she's she's still with us, but. Um, she just was slurring speech and couldn't remember things last night, like out of nowhere, couldn't remember words. And, her, and so they just, they called their doctor, doctor said go to the ER. And so they suspect a stroke and they were going to do an MRI today to find out for sure, uh, at least the extent of it. So, so pray for Miss Sarah, if you would, and, um, keep lifting her up, uh, and then keep praying. I want you to pray for, um, uh, Man, her name just escaped me. She's a member of our church. Um, lives over here buying Dunkin' Donuts. Um, <laughs> nobody else knows either. Huh? All right, it's going to come to me. All right, I'll think of it. At the, at the, she's been out for a little while now, and uh, just her, her Lord just laid her on my heart now. So, um, so I'll let you know when it comes back to me. All right, somebody else have something to add tonight? A prayer request to bring? Make Wait for... Uh, Wait for Brother Cody to come give you the mic so those online can hear us. Thank you. All right, here's Brother Bob. Um, uh, first, I guess, uh, sm- unspoken, and then um, um, correction and mercy, I guess, for loved ones. Um, uh, as, as far as my work, I just kind of realized this Sunday. Um, so we did hire three people, but even with those three people hired, and obviously they have to be trained, we still, I was telling Pastor, we still have eight positions wide open. So, um, and, and Brother Harold's kind of in the same boat. So, um, the, the thing about me is if I make a mistake, I can't, like, do a do-over or anything like that. If I make a mistake, I could potentially hurt somebody. Right. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, pray for Brother Bob's job situation. Continue to pray for that. Is Millie Miles. That's who I was trying to think of. But uh, just pray for her. I did talk to her on the phone last week but uh she still she had covid but it wasn't bad and she was still coming out of the woods a little bit though she's always had copd though and so it you know was uh kind of complicating there brother will um continued prayer for my grandfather okay will's grandpa had her cancer and pray for uh pray for don got to invite don back to church yesterday while selling him a box of donuts. <laughs> Multitasking. All right. I was on visitation selling donuts at the same time. All right. So uh, with Elijah uh, trying to see his last bit come in for camp. So, yeah, pray for pray for Don. Um, and since Brother Sam's not here tonight, unsaved loved ones, right? So he's been asking for unsaved loved ones, pr- prayer for them for decades now. And so um, pray for Don. Pray for uh, the others that we're praying for, Bill Hilliard, Dick Van Alstyne. Gary Dupree, pray for uh, uh, Renee and Sarah, all right, um, Katie and Kira's sisters, and uh, so keep lifting all of them up. All right, somebody else? Give me a prayer oh. for Cody's back. Yeah. Cody, are you making him say that? No. Just kidding. Pray for Cody's back. Yeah, Cody's, his his uh, spinal column's not great. We'll just put it that way. He's got some problems. All right. Pray for Pastor Mays. Pastor Mays, yes. We need to pray for our pastor down in Maryland has uh, uh, surgery on the 10th, if you'd lift him up in prayer. That's the pastor that I first worked under in the ministry 
when I first came out of Bible college for three years, and then uh, my wife grew up basically in his house. He's like a second parent to her, and so pray for Pastor Mays, if you would, M-A-Y-E-S. All right, somebody else? Sarah, 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 did you say Sarah? All right, we'll pray for Sarah. Lift up Sarah. All right, somebody else? Miss Abby, do you have a prayer request? Okay. An unspoken. Unspoken. Anybody else have an unspoken tonight? Can you raise your hand up? If you do, all right, the unspoken's around the room. All right, somebody else? Anything else to add? All right. Um, be in prayer for camp. I'll go ahead and add that one on there. And just start praying that God will work in the hearts of our kids and our adults, all of us uh, that go. And uh, that he'll watch over us, keep us safe, help everything go smoothly. And most of all, that he'll work through the speakers. We have several speakers. Uh, like I said, I think it's 26 total messages they hear that week. Uh, between the hillside classes, there's two speakers in the morning, then a morning chapel speaker, then the evening chapel speaker, and then they have devotions after, you know, lights out at night too. So um, it's a lot. Yep, online, uh, Tawny uh, has a prayer request. Prayers for my friend Zach, his son, and his girlfriend. Also my daughter's doctor, point, uh, doctor appointment Monday and a couple of unspokens. Okay. Miss Tawny, we're praying. Okay. And praying for those um, and unspoken. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Anything else? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As I pray aloud, you can pray right where you're at. And uh, let's lift these up before the Lord. God, we come before you. We're so grateful for the chance to be in your house tonight. Thank you for these that have gathered together. It's always a, a refueling, refreshing time on Wednesday nights to get together with your people and gather. And we thank you for the way that you... Uh, uh, work in our midst, and Lord, show yourself real in our lives, and and uh, Lord, it, it just at a moment where maybe even you're tempted uh, to 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 doubt you or be frustrated by a situation or anything like that, Lord, you swing in, Lord, you show us that if we'll just give things over to you, that you're there, and that you'll take care of stuff, and we're so grateful for that. We just pray that you would just uh, uh, be with these requests that have been mentioned tonight. We come before you uh, humbly before your throne. And, and ask these requests of you because we know, Lord, that uh, we are unable to answer these ourselves. We're unable to do anything about them ourselves. Uh, we ask for our missionaries all around the world. Lord, we, we support missionaries tonight that are getting the job done for you, that are spreading the gospel. Uh, Lord, I think of others that we didn't even read letters from tonight, but Brother Ferran tonight, I think of him. He's getting ready. Lord, he's counting down the days till he goes to Saipan. Lord, and uh, I pray that you just give him what he needs for that. Lord, I pray that you would uh, uh, continue to meet every need. Thank you for the miraculous way you provided for their shipping container that ended up costing three times more than they thought it was going to. And uh, Lord, we just give you the glory for that. And I know that he does as well. I pray that you'd be with uh, the Skeen family. Lord, I continue to pray that you'd lift them up and help them as they continue learning the language, as they continue to uh, grow in you and as their family continues to grow as well. And I just pray that uh, Brother Skeen and Miss Katrina would have a safe trip to Istanbul and back and uh, that you'd give them a, a refreshing time while they're there and also be able to accomplish what they need to accomplish with her visa. And we lift that up to you tonight. We pray for the Todds and pray for those uh, heavy restrictions going on in Costa Rica tonight and just ask you would uh, bless there. And I pray you give them fruit in spite of the fact that they're in a spiritual desert. Lord, uh, certainly we know that's the case here as we... Uh, examine our own country in light of even some other countries that, uh, Lord, uh, some time ago we would have said our country was the Christian nation and those, those other countries were pagan. And, Lord, it seems like some, in some cases it's, it's almost flipped, Lord, and that the gospel is being spread like wildfire in some places in the world, but our country is growing colder and colder by the day toward you. And uh, we are, our hearts are heavy for that, but uh, we just pray that you'd uh, turn that around. I pray for the Todds, that you would, uh, again, help them to uh, be fruitful in that spiritual desert. We pray that that new engine would work well in their vehicle. And I pray that uh, these churches that they've started and are wanting to get things going, even if it's online only or whatever, I pray that they'd be able to be effective 
and uh, Lord, for the, uh, the spiritual warfare that he mentioned in the letter that's going on between uh, uh, the devil and his angels and, Lord, uh, the angels of God and the, the spiritual wickedness in high places and the demonic activity that they're battling, would you just help them tonight and strengthen them for that battle? They need your armor. They need, uh, they need every bit of uh, spiritual armor they can muster and that you'll allow them to have, Lord, to, to battle, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to do just that. We pray for Miss Sarah tonight in the hospital, and I pray that this uh, stroke uh, would not have been too bad, that she'd be able to get back on her feet, Lord, and, uh, Lord, that she'd, you'd uh, restore uh, her abilities uh, for speaking and thinking and, and all those things, and, and uh, that they'd be able to even address anything that might happen in the future. And uh, we pray for Brother Bob and, and all the... Uh, 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 things that he needs, Lord, especially with his work situation, that they'd be able to hire more people and you'd give him the grace and strength to undergo uh, and handle the, the, the load that he's under. Lord, I pray for, um, I pray for those that are uh, needing, uh, Lord, to be corrected in you and uh, brought back to you. I pray that they would, uh, they would do that, that you would do that, Lord, that they would turn to you and, and they would realize that they need to get their lives right. Lord, I pray for Millie. Miles, Lord, tonight, you continue to help her to get back on her feet and strengthen her. I uh, pray for uh, Will's grandpa with the bladder cancer. We continue to lift him up and ask that you just bless him. We know that uh, the prayer of a, of a, of a uh, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, your word says. We thank you for that truth and uh, pray that you'd bless there. Pray for uh, the unsaved loved ones. Lord, we pray for Don. We pray for uh, Lord uh, uh, Renee and Sarah. We pray for uh, uh, Don uh, Van, S- or not Don Van Sal, but uh, uh, Dick Van Alstein and Bill Hilliard and, and, and Gary Dupree and some of these others that we've been praying for for a long, long time. We lift them up to you tonight and ask that you just soften their heart, turn them back to you, and uh, Lord, turn them to you for the first time. Let them call on you for salvation and make a public profession of faith. And uh, we just lift them up to you tonight. We pray for uh, uh, all the, the back issues in our church. I know Brother Cody's got a lot of ailments. I know Brother Jamie does too. And uh, the nerve problems that he's been undergoing, I pray that you get him uh, back to work, back on his feet. And uh, Cody as well, that you just uh, help him as well to get some relief from that, but that he'd uh, uh, to have the grace to endure whatever it is you have for him. Lord, and uh, we lift up uh, Pastor Mays down in Maryland and his uh, surgery going on on the 10th. And uh, Lord, he's a dear, dear man of God, of course, and we love him and ask that you would just help him, uh, Lord, to uh, have a successful surgery and uh, Lord, that they would be able to get everything done that they need to do there and uh, just pray for him. We pray for Sarah tonight. You'd help in that situation, whatever's going on, Lord, whatever the case is, pray you'd help there. And then for the unspokens in the room, many, many unspokens uh, that were mentioned here and online, and we just lift them up to you. Would you work? In a mighty way, Lord, uh, there's so many times that we get discouraged. Uh, me as a pastor, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but uh, get discouraged. Maybe I think, God, you're not doing anything, nothing's happening, uh, or I'm afraid that uh, progress that was made is being lost or something like that. God, would you just, uh, would you just uh, Lord, show us your, your mighty ways. Show us how awesome you are. Show us how omnipotent you are and work in these unspokens, uh, these things that uh, nobody else knows about but us. And, uh, Lord, we just want to see your mighty hand at work in our lives and in the lives of those we love. And uh, just pray for those. Pray for uh, Miss Tawny, Lord, and uh, her friend Zach, his son and girlfriend. Lord, I pray whatever the situation is there, you'd help and strengthen them. I pray you send grace their way. Lord, I pray that if they're not saved, Lord, if they don't know you as Savior, that they would turn to you in faith and get saved tonight. And uh, we thank you that uh, you've worked, Lord, in Tawny's life. I pray for all of their family as well that you would just uh, continue to help there with uh, Shannon and Dakota and Mike. And Lord, I pray that you just work in their hearts and lives tonight and just continue to help them. And uh, Lord, I pray for uh, uh, their son also and the doctor situation there. I pray you just help in their, that situation. And then lastly tonight, pray for camp and pray that you would just start to work in the hearts of uh, Brother Dave Disney, Brother Miser, Brother Garrett, and the others that are going to be speaking on the hillside. And that you would just prepare uh, all of our hearts, Lord, for what you have for us. We look forward to uh, uh, the way you're going to work in our lives. We love you, and we thank you for all you've done. And we pray that you just work now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Turn to uh, Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119. We continue with our uh, series, Loving Your Bible. I hope that these verses have been an encouragement to you. I uh, hope that these, this chapter and this uh, 
series has been a blessing and uh, that uh, God has worked in your heart through it. I know he has mine. <clears throat> and really, uh, you, you, you uh, forget just how much the Bible has to say about itself, right? You forget exactly how much the Bible has to say about the Word of God and what, uh, what the Lord has uh, for us in his Word, all right? And so verse number 89 through 96, and we're going to uh, jump in here. This is the, the uh, Hebrew letter l- Lamed, I guess is how you say that. And it means to learn and teach, okay? And uh, to learn and to teach, all right? And so let's read verse 89 through 96. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy, st- are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should, have, I should then have perished in mine affliction I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Interesting wording there that God gives us. What do you think of when you think of the word settled? What do you think of when you think of the word settled? And you can just answer in your own mind there. Uh, the word means placed, established, determined, no longer moving. Okay? Settled. Something has settled. All right? You hear it when you play golf. All right? And some guy will hit it off into the rough, and they'll say, I wonder where that one's settled. And it might be a good place, or it might be a bad place. You just never know. All right? You, maybe you've ever said, well, I guess that's settled. You ever said that? That means whatever you were talking about, whatever was up in the air, it's not up in the air anymore. <clears throat> whatever was up for debate, it's not for up to, for debate anymore. Whatever, whatever you were fighting with your spouse about, fight's over, right? Okay, maybe, <laughs> like, no, it'll come up again, Pastor, I promise you, I know. Or maybe you've just said to somebody, let's just settle this once and for all. Let's just settle this once and for all. And you, what it means is let's just figure out the truth and let's get down to the bottom of it. Let's scrape away all the, ex, the extra stuff and all the, all the different things and let's get down to the, to the nitty-gritty and settle it once and for all. He says in the first verse, Oh, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. <clears throat> we see God's faithfulness reflected in his settled word. And that's the title tonight is this, the settled word. What does the settled word mean? What does that give us? What does that bring in our lives, and how does it apply to our life? God's faithfulness reflected in his settled word. The psalmist here meditated on the unchanging nature of God's word. Because it is settled in heaven, it will not change on earth. Amen? It's it's unchanging. There's quite a debate, even in Bible colleges and seminaries these days, uh, over what's the Word of God, and is this the Word of God? Where do we find the Word of God? Is there the Word of God? And, and, and tr- the truth is, we don't care for any of that because we know forever, O oh Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. And we know that if God promised that His Word is settled and promised that He would preserve it, we know it has to be somewhere on this earth. We know He left it for us and He settled it, that it's preserved. And that, uh, that uh, a God that's able to speak this universe into existence, existence is able to preserve his word for us. Of course, we believe that to be in our King James Bible. Amen. What a blessing it is to know we have this, the solid foundation under our feet. After tossing about on a sea of trouble, though, the psalmist here, almost you hear him leaping to shore. Remember last week? We're at the end of our rope, Remember? All right, we were struggling. There was, there was affliction. There was all kinds of problems. And almost you, you hear him come into this verse and going, man, i got to get out of this sh- shifting sand and get on a solid rock. I'm jumping out of the sea and, and, and jump to the shore, stand upon a rock. I'm thankful God's word is not fickle. It's not uncertain. It's settled. It's determined. It's fixed. It's sure. It's immovable. Man's teachings change so often, don't they? They change so often that there's never a time for them, that there's not even time for them to be settled. By the time that they think they've settled on one thing, they're changing again. Look at our country. Things that 10 years ago people were saying, no, that's not true, that can't be, or that's wrong. Now they're saying, oh, that's okay. 
Uh, even our own president, stuff in the, he said in the 90s, realize he was pro-life in the 90s? Was saying stuff like, he was saying stuff in the 90s like, how dare the, the government tell us we have to spend money on something we disagree with? Out of his own mouth? And now he's, whoa, shifting. It's not settled with them. I'm thankful it's settled with the Lord. Truth is truth. The Lord's word is from old the same. You know, it says the other spot in the Bible, and it will remain unchanged eternally. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's settled in heaven. I'm glad that the psalmist declared not just that it was his word or man's word, but thy word. Thy word. It's not the words of man, but the very words of God. And he believed that scriptures came from heaven. He believed that they didn't come from earth and, and from the Lord, Jehovah God, and not from man. Uh, he believed what uh, Paul wrote some hundreds of years later in 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, you probably quote it with me. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's profitable. This means more than just saying that God inspired the men. What do you mean, Pastor? It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, the, those words have meanings. And it means more than just saying that God inspired the men. All Scripture given by inspiration. Oh, yeah, Pastor, he must have inspired those guys to say that stuff, to write that stuff down. Well, we do believe that he inspired the men. But God inspired, first and foremost, the very words that they wrote. We notice this, it doesn't say all scripture writers are inspired by God. It doesn't say that, even though they were inspired by God, if you want to use that in that sense. Yet that statement doesn't go far enough. All scripture writers are inspired by God. No, the words they wrote were breathed by God. That word inspiration means God breathed. God breathed. The words they wrote were breathed by our God. Your word, Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's settled in heaven. It isn't that God breathed into the human authors. That is true, but that's not what Paul wrote. He, said, he says that out from heaven, God breathed out of them his holy word. And Peter, it says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that's how the word of God came about. We remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18. One jot, one tittle shall, in no means, shall by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Paraphrasing there. That jot refers to the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It looks like a half a letter. And then the tittle is a small part, uh, just a small mark in the Hebrew letter, kind of like crossing a T or the tail on a Y. These are tiny, uh, small, almost insignificant differences in that language yet jesus said that even those smallest differences would not pass away from god's word even the smallest things would not pass away from god's word if he cares about even the smallest little marks don't you think he cares about every word absolutely he does and he said that heaven and earth would sooner pass away that either a jot or a tittle would pass from the law from the from his word forever O lord thy word is settled in heaven Verse number 90, it says, the fa Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. And these verses kind of go together into verse number 91 as well. But the psalmist believed that the settled word of God was a demonstration of the faithfulness of God. This is a demonstration right here of God's faithfulness. This is proof of God's faithfulness. We're going to get into it just a little bit, just how, how much adversity the Bible has faced over the years. But his faithfulness extends across all generations. And we recognize the truth of this when we look at generations past. We trace the line of the amazing faithfulness of God through each generation. We read the Bible all the way back to the creation of the world. And we see his faithfulness to, 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 to Abraham. We see his faithfulness to, to uh, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And then on down to Moses. And, and all the way through, we see his faithfulness all the way through in his word. Uh, despite the worst impulses even of the people he was using. I'm glad he uses imperfect people. I'm glad I'm, you know, I'm glad I'm not required to be absolutely perfect in order for God to use me because we'd all be sunk, wouldn't we? 
despite our impulses, despite some of the works of men, God's still able to do it, his faithfulness. We recognize the truth of this when we consider not just the past, but present and future generation. And let's be honest, the present and future often look gloomy. They, uh, it's not looking so hot. Now, I don't know what God's doing. I don't know if he'll tarry another thousand years. I, it was as I was praying, I was thinking of all the places where the gospel is going forward. They say that the gospel spread like wildfire in China and North Korea, places like that. We know that Philippines are sending out missionaries by the droves to all over Asia. America's falling cold, but it doesn't mean, maybe that doesn't mean God's done with this world yet. And maybe we'll fall by the wayside, but as we read the Bible, we don't see our name in there anywhere. So who knows? But the future often looks gloomy. We wonder where, uh, where, where are the great men and women of God that we've seen in previous generations. I'm reading the, uh, the biography of Adoniram Judson right now. Just an amazing, amazing leap of faith for a man to do what he did. And there were other missionaries unnamed that we'll never hear about until we get to heaven that were doing the same thing. But we shouldn't fear no matter what the present looks like, no matter what the future looks like, what happens? God's faithfulness endureth. It's unto all generations. We recognize the truth of that when we consider how God has preserved His Word through the generations. There's a lot of great works of ancient literature that are, that are lost, never to be seen again, never be read again. Uh, one author or another makes mention of them, but we have no text of them that has survived to this day. There's lots of them like that. The Bible not only survives, it thrives. I think it was in that movie, uh, uh, what's that movie, uh, Case for Christ, they, they, they talked about the evidence and the manuscript evidence for the Word of God. And uh, all the manuscript evidence we have for Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, I think if you stacked them all up, it was like this high. And if you stacked up all the manuscript evidence for the Bible, it was like higher than you could even see. And yet people take Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, they don't doubt for a second those guys were real. Don't doubt for a second that those guys wrote what they wrote. And yet if you say Jesus wrote this, despite the mountain of evidence, they want to cast doubt on it and be skeptical about it. But there's a lot of great works that haven't survived. The Bible not only survives, it thrives. Throughout much of, of, of time, the Bible was an object of extreme hatred by lots of those in authority, uh, Hitler would burn the Bible, man. They would, they would pile them up and burn them. They tried to stamp it out, but it survived. In the early days of the church, there were skeptics that were trying to destroy it by their arguments. Later on, Roman emperors, Diocletian and Julian, they tried to totally outlaw Bibles throughout all the Roman Empire and destroy it by force. And there was times where people were passing around little pages of the Bible because that's all they could get their hands on in Europe. We hear about the Waldensians and some of these Baptist history uh, forefathers of ours that, that uh, gave their lives uh, just for a little scrap of the Bible. They would try to memorize them in case it was ever taken away from them again. In some periods of history, it was a capital offense to possess a copy of the Bible. The Dark Ages were called the Dark Ages because of the spiritual darkness that was in our world. For a thousand years, 500 to 1500, that spiritual darkness per permeated, permeated the world. The Bible was in scarcity, but it was still there. The Word of God never failed. It was being passed around here and there and everywhere. The Bible survived, and now it's in greater abundance now than ever. You'll never eliminate the Bible now. I mean, they never would have anyway. But I'm telling you what, we got Bibles all over the place. <laughs> Good luck getting rid of it. God makes sure that his faithfulness is unto all generations. Second part of the verse says, Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances for all uh, thy servants, servants. Think about what those words are saying. The word of God itself, uh, 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 God's ordinances is what established the earth and caused it to abide. He spoke it into existence. All of creation began with a word from God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke, let it be, and it was. So it's no surprise that they are also sustained and that they endure according to the word of God. This earth keeps spinning around because of the word of God. It gives 
whole new understanding to a, a couple of wonderful statements in Scripture. I'll turn there, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 8 says this. It says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of God, our God shall stand forever. Creation. Amen. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Of course, Matthew chapter 24, 35 is a familiar verse to us. Jesus speaking there in the uh, Olivet Discourse. All right. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 35. It's a short verse. It says this, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It gives a whole new understanding to those scriptures we talk about how he says that, that uh, 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 thou hast established the earth and it abideth. It's a testament to God's faithfulness. These passages put the word of God outside of the created world, almost outside of the universe, and it is, and indicate that the word of God is more permanent and enduring than even the creation itself, more, more sustainable than the orbit of the earth around the sun more sustainable than the orbit of the moon around the earth, more sustainable than gravity under our feet is the Word of God. It's all that stuff is just a testament. There's not been one day that I got up out of bed and didn't, wasn't able to count on gravity to hold me down. Amazing. God's more faithful than that. There's not been one day since I was born that the sun didn't rise. Amazing. God's more faithful than the sun. It rises because he put it there. It rises because of his faithfulness. It's all of it. As you look around, the heavens declare the glory of God. How? Their consistency and their reliability. 500 years ago, men were navigating. 500 years ago, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, men were navigating the oceans by the stars. Well, there's that star. It's there every night. Why do you think that is? God's faithfulness. It's all testimonies to God's faithfulness. Since the created world came into being by God's word and is sustained by his word, it makes perfect sense that the psalmist would say, Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances. God, God, through his word, established all this. All the order. All the regularity. And, and, and the day that you wake up and you say, Is God going to be faithful today? Just watch the sunrise. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, right? It says, for all are thy servants. All of this created order. The psalmist looked at it and he understood that it ultimately serves God and his purposes. It serves God and his purposes. In fact, Genesis 1 tells us he gave us the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night. And, and he put it all in order as a testament to his, to his faithfulness. The earth, he established it and and uh, it, it abides, it obeys his word. It says, all are thy servants. The sun is the servant of God. The moon is the servant of God. The earth is the servant of God. The sun, the stars, the billions of stars in the galaxies, they're all God's servant. They, they scream the glory of God and testify of his faithfulness. It reflects the faithfulness of the Lord. The second thing is this, God's sustaining power ref is reflected in his settled word. Not just his faithfulness, but his sustaining power. First part of verse 92 says, Unless thy law had been my delights. He rejoiced that the word of God had been his delight. And, and reading and studying and meditating on God's word weren't a burden to him. They were a delight to him. Listen, how do you view God's word? We talked about this a lot the last several months of Wednesday nights as we've gone through this chapter. How do you view your Bible reading? Is it a burden to you? Is it, is it, a, is it, a, is it a, a, a drag to you, or is it a delight? They were a delight to the psalmist. Unless thy law had been my delights, he says, I should then have perished in mine affliction. And he knew, this. listen, without his relationship with God, without his relationship with God's word, he would not have been sustained in a season of affliction. And you say, well, what does this, this, this mean for us? Well, there's a difference here. There's a difference between those who endure the word of God. Focus up here now. There's a difference between those who endure the word of God. They drag themselves to church. They have no interest in reading the Bible. They really come to church and don't have any interest in what's even said there. There's a difference between those kinds of people, and there are those out there, and those who delight in his word. Those who delight in his word. 
What's the difference? Well, one leads to strength in times of affliction, and the other leads to succumbing to those afflictions. One, when you are, uh, church is a drag to you, and you have to drag yourself there just to get there, and, and it has no place in your life, really, and, and, and really, even you come, you're not even paying attention, you're, you, the, the Word of God is just whatever, he's going to get up there and preach, and I'm here because, you know, my husband made me come, or my wife made me come, or whatever it may be, uh, or I'm expected to, or if I don't, pastor's going to call me, and I really don't delight in the Word of God, though, I'm not delighting in the preaching, I don't have a hunger for it, per se, I just kind of whatever, you know, it's I'm just here, I don't read my Bible. It sits on my shelf the rest of the week. Uh, I don't even. I don't even go so far as to start a Bible reading plan on my app on my phone. Well, those are the people that the slightest adversity comes and they're out. They're not serving God anymore. They're done serving the Lord. Something comes up, they just skip. They don't come to church when something comes up. They just. They just. Well, well we're just going to not go. The slightest little thing gets them to quit or skip. Uh, the slightest little thing gets them thrown off, and they don't read their Bible. They don't have any delight in God's Word. They don't have any hunger for it. And the adversity comes, and affliction comes. And they can't endure it because they have no spiritual strength in their life. Delighting in God's Word brings spiritual strength in your life. How are you going to make it, Christian, if you don't have a delight in the Word of God? How are you going to make it? How are you going to hear, well done, and when you see uh, the Lord in heaven one day? How are you going to cross the finish line? I want to finish strong. I want to get to the end of my life and say, I didn't stop serving God. I wasn't perfect, but I didn't quit. I stayed with it. I didn't have stretches of my life where I didn't uh, go to church. Or I didn't have stretches of my life where I didn't read my Bible. I didn't have stretches of my life where I was just, I was just out of it. I want to stay faithful. Don't you have a hunger to be faithful and to be found faithful? Well, I hope you do. But that's the difference. Some people delight in the Word of God. Man, it's a joy. It's a delight. They can't wait to get in the Bible every day. They can't wait to spend time with the Lord every day. It's refreshing. And it's a delight to them. Well, what happens? He says, unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I wouldn't have made it through my trials if I didn't have delight in God's Word. I wouldn't have made it through my trials if I didn't have a hunger to be where God's Word was and to hear the preaching of God's Word. Man, I, I, that's, it's sustaining. It, it, it drives me crazy to see people when they, they leave or they move away and they, they, uh, they, they, they don't even ask the pastor, can you help me find a church, pastor? Why? Because they have no intention of going to one when they get where they're going. Most of the time, that's why they don't ask. I've learned. Say, pastor, how do you know that? Because I see the people that leave and that they're not going to church anywhere. I'm not just, I'm talking about moving away or moving out of state or moving out of the air. I'm not talking about just people that leave the church in general. But a lot of people have no intentions of going to church. They don't really want. Maybe that they're moving because they want to get away from the accountability of this church. They know if they just stopped coming here and lived in this area, they would have to be accountable. You never know. Hard times come for all, though. Everybody's going to go through affliction. Everybody's going to go through struggles. The question is, will you perish? The psalmist said, if I hadn't delighted in your word, I would have perished in my affliction. Or are you going to have the sustaining power that comes from delighting in his word? Well, we went through some health scares, Pastor. We had some, we had some uh, uh, financial difficulty. We just couldn't come to church. We just couldn't be there. Well, maybe you need to delight in God's word more. The psalmist said, I delight in his word, and that's what got me through my affliction. I made it a priority in my life. Are you going to have that sustaining power that comes from delighting in his word? Delighting in reading it, delighting in obeying it, delighting in sitting under the preaching of it. Notice some words here in these two verses. Seven words between verses 92, or in, throughout verse 92. Unless, or not unless, Thy law, my delights, in mine affliction. See those words there? Thy law, my delights, in mine affliction. Now, I'm not trying to rearrange the Bible or take verse, words out of it, but it, it brought about this uh, story told by an old Scottish preacher from the 1700s, Alexander Wallace. He says this, he says, I happened to be standing in a grocer's shop one day, 
in a large manufacturing town in the west of Scotland when a poor, old, frail widow came in to make a few purchases. There never was, perhaps in that town, a more severe time of distress. Nearly every, every loom was stopped. Decent and respectable tradesmen who had seen better days and were obliged to subsist on public charity. So much money per day, but a trifle at most, was allowed to the really poor and deserving. Just a little bit. The poor widow had received her daily pittance, and she had now come into the shop of the grocer to lay it out to the best advantage. She had but a few coppers in her withered hand. Carefully did she expend her little stock. A penny worth of this and, and the other necessary of life nearly exhausted all that she had. She came to the very last penny, and with a singular expression of heroic contentment and cheerful resignation on her wrinkled face, she said this, Now I must buy oil with this that I may see to read my Bible during these long, dark nights. For it is my only comfort now when every other comfort has gone away. Do you put that kind of priority on God's word in your life? Do I? If I was in that widow's position and I was depending on a few pennies from the townspeople to get me through my day and just scraping by, would I save one penny to light my candle so that I could, or light my lamp so I could read the Bible? Because it's my only comfort during these days. Man, that's humbling. Humbling. Verse 93 says, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. The psalmist remembered the life-giving power. Same thing he had said in verse number 88 of the previous section. He remembered the life-giving power and character of God's word. It was this life that strengthened him in that season of affliction. Why? It brings life because it's alive. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's alive. And so it brings life. He's quickened us by it. Verse 94 says, I am thine, save me. He speaks of the wonderful relationship between the psalmist and his God. I am thine. <laughs> I am thine. You know, if I ever needed to, and I was in dire straits, really dire straits, you know who I'd call? my dad and I would say I'm thine will you help me anybody else might call you and may or may not help them but I know you'll help me because I am thine what a great relationship we have between our heavenly father and us and we can go to him and say I am thine it flows from the word of God he says I am thine save me for I have sought thy precepts uh, save me based on the fact that I've sought after your word he recognized that God was his God and his Father. He recognized that salvation was not in himself. He recognized that God hears and answers prayer. And then he recognized that God would indeed save him. And then the second part of it, again, the basis of that confidence in that relationship was that the relationship was built upon his precepts, the Word of God. It wasn't a relationship built on feelings or just subjective experiences, but upon the solid foundation of God's Word. Verse number 95, he says this, The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. He speaks of his enemies almost in a casual way almost. While they do their worst against him, they're waiting to destroy him. He's not going to panic. He'll just find refuge in the Word of God. Find refuge in the Word of God. Then, there's true perfection in the settled word. We're almost done. True perfection in the settled word. Verse 96, I have seen an end of all perfection. Isn't that an amazing statement? You, the first time you read it, you go, what, that? what are you even talking about? I've seen an end of all perfection. The psalmist considered all the excellent things he'd seen in this world. You ever seen the perfect sunset? Or the perfect sunrise? Or beautiful waterfalls? Of course, up here we have no shortage of those. Uh, just awesome things that God has created or things that people have made. Man, that is perfect. And you've said that. The basis, I'm sorry, that he considered the excellent things that he had seen in this world and maybe he even thought of great natural beauty. Uh, small things, you think about the, the eyeball. Think about the human brain. Think about just the DNA 
that courses through our veins, billions upon billions upon billions of strands of DNA. Just amazing things that God has created in creation. The beauty of the fact that God gave us the ability to love, the ability to care for people, the ability to have a self-awareness. Well, at least most people do. Some people may not. All right? Kidding. Things of some ways. Think of some ways that you've used the word perfect before. And yet all of those things have an end. Even the most beautiful creation here has an end. We're not supposed to worship the creature. We're not supposed to worship the earth. We admire the sunrise, the sunset, the waterfalls, but we don't worship them. Why? Because even they have an end. They have a limit. They have a barrier. They're they're not going to last forever. The best things of this world only go so far, but nothing is as perfect as the Word of God. He says, I have seen the end, an end of all perfection. Despite all these great and beautiful things that he's seen, something is greater still, and that is what? It says, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. The commandment of God, his revealed word to us, his word is not limited like all those other things, even the great things of this earth. His word is perfect. His word was before creation. His word is the sustainer of creation. His word will endure beyond creation. You know, the strange thing is, a lot of people say that the Bible is narrow. Huh. Narrow-minded. You ever think of that? You ever been called narrow-minded because you believe it? It's a, not, that's not what the Bible says. It says the Word of God is broad. They think of themselves, this world does, as extreme. they think they've evolved. They're broad-minded. And you're narrow-minded. Yet they show so little tolerance for those who disagree with them. But they're supposed to be the broad-minded people. But they have only this lane. If you don't get in that lane, then you're this, this, and this. And you're that, that, and that. And you're a horrible person. God's word is indeed exceeding broad. It'll make us broad-minded in the sense that we will be broad-hearted. We will even be loving of people that disagree with us because of the word of God. We'll show them the love of Christ. I read a great testimony of a girl who was caught up in the LGBT movement and all that stuff, and God delivered her. Amazing. Awesome. And it was the love of God's people and the difference that they showed in her life. All the anger and hatred and cynicism that she saw on her side versus the people that just love people. Oh, they didn't endorse their sin, but they loved you, and she knew that they loved you. If we read and we obey the word of God, this truly is, it's broad. It covers, the Bible says, love covereth a multitude of sins. It is broad. It is broad. Now, narrow is the way that leadeth to, to life everlasting, the Bible says. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many bear be that find it because many won't accept this word. So much is unsettled in our world. In fact, we would probably describe what we see going on in our world as unsettling, right? Unsettling. The last year and a half have definitely been unsettling. Just because so much is unsettled doesn't mean you have to be unsettled. You are only as settled as you have settled on the settled word. So tonight, how settled are you? How settled are you? His word is settled in heaven. If you'll anchor to this and what I preach tonight from this and what the Bible says right here, settle right here. Well, Pastor, what do you mean by settled? Well, we defined that word, didn't we? Be established. Proverbs 4 says, let all thy ways be established. Remove, not, remove thy foot from evil and let all thy ways be established. Be settled. Well, how can I be? Anchor to the settled word. Follow it, obey it, delight in it. That word means no longer moving. Don't be a flake. Don't be somebody that you can can count on one this week, but you can't count on them next week. You can count on them this day, but you can't count on them the next day. You don't know what you're going to find. Get settled on the settled word. Delight in it. Find joy in it. Turn to it. Make it a priority in your life. Amen? Let's all stand together. Thank you for your attentiveness tonight. I want to say thank you to uh, thank you to everybody who came 
uh, the other night, and if you uh, had a few people say, Pastor, we forgot our check or we forgot to do this as far as our donation for youth camp, uh, what can we do about that? Just write camp on it. I just realized we forgot to move the table back in here. We have no uh, offering basket tonight. We need to uh, snag that from the fellowship hall there. All right, but, um, uh, but thank you for coming. We had almost 80 at the dinner on Sunday night, which is awesome. And we had a great time. So just if you want to give toward camp from now until we leave, it's okay. Go ahead and do it. Um, just write camp, designate however much write camp on there, and the guys will make sure that it gets designated the right place. All right. And then uh, uh, we've got uh, our missionary coming this Sunday, Mike Kelly to Suriname. And so come and be faithful then and hear him uh, preach in the evening, give his presentation in the morning. And then uh, we've got Father's Day coming up, and that is uh, a couple weeks away, uh, uh, just giving all the ladies a reminder for gifts and stuff, okay, just make sure you have plenty of notice, can't say you didn't know, or didn't sneak up on you, all right, if you even have time, Amazon Prime, you'll be fine, okay, all right, uh, make sure the baby bottles get turned in by Father's Day, though, okay, uh, the baby bottles for the, uh, the Pregnancy Resource Center, okay, and so those are due by that day, and then Faith and Freedom Sunday, coming up on July 4th, and we'll have a morning service, an afternoon, uh, like a meal. We'll have a picnic. I'm not sure. We'll see how the weather's looking. We'll have a meal, and then, uh, uh, and then we'll let you know more about what you can bring or whatever as we get closer, uh, but then we'll have the uh, afternoon service on the grounds and then be done for the day that day, and uh, uh, then uh, we have our t-shirts uh, that uh, we have designed. Maybe you can't see them very well there. Always rejoicing. Um, and that's the design. That's what it's going to look like within a shade or two, okay? All right? But it's uh, $12 a piece. We tried to get it down to $10. It wasn't possible. In fact, to get it to $12, we really need to have at least 40 order, which we usually do. Uh, but uh, see my wife to sign up to buy a T-shirt. It's a church T-shirt for the year, and it has our yearly theme, and it's always a lot of fun to have those to wear uh, to different things or whatever. And it's going to be a decent T-shirt. I think it looks pretty good. It, I don't, I, you know, I don't, the, the tie-dye thing is in right now, all right, and uh, so my wife convinced me that tie-dye is in, and she showed me, look, he's wearing tie-dye, she's wearing tie-dye, look, it's in, okay, all right, so I believe her, I trust her fashion sense better than my own, that's for sure, all right, every Wednesday and Sunday, it's like, should I wear this tie or that tie, or neither, <laughs> she's like, neither, let me grab one for you, so anyway, I trust her, all right, so see her to order and to sign up. She'll get you signed up, tell her what size you need, and uh, we need to know that. I think I told them by the, uh, I want to say, what's the, uh, sorry, the 27th, I think, is when we're going to have that order in, so two and a half weeks from now, okay? All right, and so pray about that, and then uh, listen to the Lord, because he'll say, sign up, okay? We really need to hit, like, 40 in order to get the $12 price, so, uh please do so, so we don't take a hit on them, all right? Uh, but that'd be a blessing. I hope you had a enjoyable time tonight, and I hope that it was good. I hope it challenged you uh, from the Word of God, and uh, hopefully you'll take it to heart. Let's close in a word of prayer and ask God's blessings as we go. Lord, thank you for bringing us together into your house tonight, and God, thank you that your Word is settled in heaven. God, uh, there's so much that's shifting. There's so much that's changing. Lord, we have a whole faction of our country that calls themselves progressives, Lord, and that very term means they're, they're not going to stay the same. They're going to keep moving, and uh, they're going to keep shifting. They're going to keep changing their morals and changing what they say is right and wrong. I can't even imagine what 10 and 20 years from now could hold if things don't change. And, uh, Lord, so we just, we just thank you that we have your word that is settled. I pray that we would be settled. We would be anchored. We would not be moving. We would not be shifting. That we would not, we, we, we would not be flaky and not able to be counted on, Lord, but you'd be able to depend on us as, as faithful believers, Lord, that we'd be as faithful as the sun coming up and the sun going down, Lord, and uh, thank you for the evidence of your settledness all around us. We're so grateful, and uh, we're thankful for how you work in our hearts. Thank you for how you use your word in our lives. I pray that we would delight in it this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Thank you, folks.